ago, I found myself with an unlikely group of people in a Quaker meeting house in Bristol. We'd come to listen to this man, <coughs> Tibor Putnoki, a Hungarian speaking through a translator, and he had an extraordinary story. We heard about an unhappy childhood in a state orphanage, which had involved considerable abuse and illness. He dreamt of becoming a pilot and had eventually fulfilled his dreams, but after a serious accident had had to undergo a series of operations. In 1993, he contracted a serious illness and clinically died. A doctor tried to resuscitate him and was actually sitting on top of him during this nine minutes when he was clinically dead. During this time, he had what's called a near-death experience. Tibor found himself above his body, looking down at what was happening. <clears throat> he then decided to move away and found himself in a small room next door where two nurses were speaking. They were organising a trolley, and he saw that a syringe fell off the trolley and rolled under a cabinet. He followed the syringe and was able to see through the wrapped packaging a number on one side and some writing on the other. The nurses then started talking and one phoned her husband as she was worried about her sick children. He was interested in the conversation and found himself in the flat where the husband was looking through a phone book trying to find the doctor's number. He noticed the rather incongruous white socks the man was wearing with little red horses going around the top. <laughs> he then found himself back in the hospital and moved to the room upstairs where there was a ward of patients waiting to be discharged. He looked down and noted the names and the discharge dates of the various patients. After that, he described going up in a kind of escalator accompanied by somebody who had a very loving presence who he recognised as a spirit guide who'd been with him throughout his life. He was then shown a kind of split screen. On one side, he saw his life and all the things he had done. On the other side, he saw the things that he could have done, the different possibilities of his life. He was given a series of messages, one of which was to be happy, something he had never been before. He felt at home and at peace for the first time in his life, and would have been very happy to stay there, but was told no, he had to go back again, and found himself back in his body, with the doctor still on top, trying to restart his heart. He then told the doctor what had just happened to him. The doctor, being sceptical, um, didn't believe it, but he went next door and spoke to the nurses, and saw the, found the syringe with the, the packaging, the writing, the letters. He then went upstairs and looked down at the names and the discharge dates of the various patients, all of which tallied with the story Tibor had told. He was so shocked at this point that he wanted to go and see the husband and the flat, but he couldn't drive, so he had to ask one of the nurses to drive him. The flat was exactly as Tibor had described it, including the man's white socks with the little red horses. <laughs> Tibor, during the time he'd been in the hospital, had been um, confined to bed and unconscious. Now, what interested Tibor in this story was the spiritual messages he was given, and it transformed his life. He's devoted his life since then to spiritual and physical healing. What interested me most was the sheer amount of evidential information it contained. In other words, facts that could be verified then and there things which he could not have seen from his position lying in that hospital room. Tibor's story is unusually detailed, but it isn't unique. A recent scientific study of cardiac arrest patients, led by Sam Parnia, Peter Fennick and colleagues, found that some of them had periods of clarity and memories while clinically dead. One 57-year-old man could correctly describe things that had happened and that he'd heard and seen as if he'd been seeing it from the corner of the room rather than from his trolley when he had no brainstem activity. There are in fact thousands of such accounts, including a very famous one of an American singer-songwriter called Pam Reynolds, who in 1991 underwent brain surgery. During that time her eyes were covered and she had white noise going into her ears, but nevertheless when she came round could describe the events that had happened during her operation accurately. 
This phenomenon wasn't widely known in the West until the 1970s, but it certainly isn't new. There are accounts of people returning from apparent death or of leaving their bodies during shock and trauma from almost every culture and period of history. The earliest recorded accounts are over 3,000 years old. Plato knew about them, and Native Americans know about and value these experiences. People in Africa also tell stories of people who have returned from the grave, but they tend to be rather frightened of them. Nevertheless, people tell the stories all the same. In other words, whatever the attitude, culture, time or religion, the content of near-death experience is similar. It seems, therefore, that the religious ideas of a spirit or soul, of heavenly enlightened beings, of life after death in a beautiful realm, of unconditional love as the highest value, are based at least in part on these experiences. There are many theories of the origin and development of religion. Some are theological, based on the idea that God or gods reveal themselves to us, and all we have to do as human beings is to receive them rather than discover the nature of that reality. Karl Marx was interested in how the powerful use religion to oppress the common people and maintain the status quo. He described it as, to quote, the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The French sociologist Emile Durkheim pointed out that religious systems generally replicate society. A hierarchical society will have a hierarchical religion with a powerful god, usually male. A more egalitarian society gives rise to male and female deities. In other words, we make religions in our own image. Herbert Spencer developed an evolutionary scale in which magic was replaced by religion, and then religion itself went through stages from animism to polytheism, to monotheism, and then he supposed it would be worship of the unknowable. Spencer, like many others, assumed that science would eventually displace religion. For early, tw early 20th century anthropologist Bronislaw Malinowski, religion helps people satisfy their psychological needs. If, for instance, you're going on a dangerous sailing expedition in a canoe, it can be helpful to bless your boat and um, carry out rituals to um, assure good weather and safety. Philosophers and scientists from René Descartes in the 17th century and David Hume in the 18th, through to biologist Richard Dawkins in the 21st century, have often regarded religion as fundamentally mistaken. It's at best fairy tales for children, at worst a dangerous delusion that can lead to violence and social disintegration. Whatever the views or expectations of scholars, religion continues to play a fundamental role in human societies and shows no signs of disappearing. <clears throat> On January the 31st, 1981, I received a telephone call from the Royal Marsden Hospital. My father, who had been suffering from cancer, had just died. As I looked at his body, it was clear to me that although it resembled my father, it wasn't him. Whatever made it my father had gone. What I saw was an empty shell. At the time, I had little idea where he had gone, the essence of my father. I vaguely believed in heaven, but had no idea what it might be like. My subsequent research into various disciplines and cultures taught me that we actually know a good deal about where people might go when consciousness separates from the physical body. We all experience this separation in dreams. The dead can and sometimes do communicate from the other side of the grave. They do this through dreams, telepathy, physical signs and symbols, through mediums and through shamans. They might speak, write or impress themselves on our dreams and thoughts. The story they tell shows a remarkable consistency. They say that death is not hard. We just step from one body into another, but equally real one. We don't sit around on clouds or burn in fiery pits. The world that we initially see is very similar to the one we've left, not least because much of it is created by our thoughts and expectations. It reflects the life we've lived on Earth. We're not judged, but we judge ourselves. Sooner or later, all spirits decide to continue their journey by raising their vibrational frequency through love and service to others. 
These are elements of mystical religion, religion that are best explained by direct experience. People often describe a sense of remembering rather than learning about the afterlife, even if what they learn is not what they want, believe, or find aesthetically or intellectually satisfying. It is often at odds with orthodox religious teaching and dogma. Religions tell us that life is only part of a bigger picture, insubstantial in the great scheme of things. There are many other worlds and forms of existence on the material plane, which is only one of many planes, some material, some immaterial. There are people who claim to have experienced these other worlds firsthand, or to be in contact with those who dwell there. If all this seems far-fetched and removed from everyday experience, I'd like to leave you with one of my favourite quotes from Albert Einstein. Reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. Thank you. Thank you.